Welcome to the No Clip Podcast. This is episode, or sorry, this is No Clip Crewcast. I'll get it one day, I promise. It's hard to say all those C's. It's a lot of letters in a row. Uh, no Clip Crewcast. This is episode 170, and we're feeling something that right. Oh no, this is episode 170, and I'm here with some heroes. There we go. I saved it. Uh, Flank Howley. Flank, how's it going? <laughs> Good. I, I, I was just saying to Jeremy, like, I feel all right. My, I'm finally leveled out from jet lag. I feel like. Waking up at 2 a.m. for like two weeks straight, like I w- it was insane. I felt crazy, but I did get a lot of reading done. But now I'm like going to bed at like midnight, waking up at eight, which is like normal. And I'm sure it will slide into like waking, whatever. So I'm actually doing all right. I but I, I feel kind of tapped out of like game stuff. Like I haven't really been. I don't know what's going on in the zeitgeist, but I have Jesse and Jeremy, so I'm I'm eager to hear what you guys are up to, and I will try to ask as many questions as possible. But so I feel like I didn't do homework, but I don't know. We're 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 chilling. I don't know. It's, I'm all right. Dude, that's fine. We're just hanging out. It's yeah, just, yeah, we're just vibing for an hour and change. You know, keeping it light, keeping it tight. But you know, you did mention that we are we are joined by the always fantastic Jeremy Jane. Jeremy, how are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm having horrible allergies, which is weird because I never oh. have allergies. But um, yeah, I'm getting blasted, dude. I just feel like my I'm getting blasted in all my face holes. Oh man! Oh yeah! You know what? That reminds me. You you were the J hole, and uh, that I was that I was filling one week. I filled the F hole for Frank another week. I didn't realize I've been filling the D hole for like two weeks now. Jesus! And dude. He, you know he's <laughs> he's still he, update on Danny. By the way, sorry. I, I love to open this this uh, update on his health by calling him a D hole. Um, he's uh, he's doing well. I don't know if you if you don't follow him on Twitter. Uh, he is doing okay. He's had a surgery. He got something removed. I'm sure he'll have more updates in the future. Uh, getting an organ removed is not exciting, but he's doing well. Uh, he's keeping us in touch on uh, on what's going on, future projects, stuff like that. So Danny's doing well. I'm sure he'll be back next week, if not uh, very soon at the very least. So we're all glad to know that he's doing well. I'm sure everyone else is excited to hear that uh, he's healthy and uh He's gaming still, watching TV. He's posting. So as long as he's posting, then he's living. Right? He's that's, gaming that's and he's matters. posting. That's what his doctor asked him. He was like, oh, now, Mr. O'Dwyer, are you, are you gaming? And he's like, yeah. He's like, oh, you post? And then you're going to be fine. Prognosis is very good. <laughs> but you don't want to post too much because then you're a terminal poster. And yeah, then it's just, yeah that was, that's a loaded question is the, it's the posting one. He's like, how much? <laughs> and then he looked concerned. Yeah, your levels are off on posting. <laughs> anyway. Uh, you know, we're only able to post thanks to our Battle Pass holders, our Battle Post holders, perhaps, on Patreon who support us and all of our hard work. Uh, and if you'd like to be one of those, you can do so at patreon.com slash noclip. You can support this 100% ad-free podcast. You can fund our documentaries. You get a bunch of stuff. There's, like, bonus videos. Jeremy just put up a bunch of extended interviews from our Pentiment documentary that you can check out right now. Uh, they're all fantastic. There's bonus podcast episodes. You get you can get on the Discord and talk to us privately. Share your innermost secrets and desires uh it's it's very fun there's there's different channels for stuff it's great you can do so at patreon.com slash no like i said give us support just like these fantastic battle pass holders harry flanagan battle royale games arno richard matherson james brown mark rojas ryan cobb tucker morgan crimson cyclist sven hooster pez tim robinson forrest pruitt eric hamilton schneider i was thinking about how to do the cameron lad this week um, and I was thinking, what's that Pearl Jam song? Jeremy? I'm oh. still alive. <laughs> so you do Cameron Land. Yes. Cam- Anyways, uh, Zachary Snader, Alex Sharp, Alex Goucher, George Zirkotis, Jacob Godserve, Tohir Tiliev, and Ryson. Thank you all so much for your continued support. You're the best. Uh, and it's just great to know that so many people want to uh, keep the podcast, keep the documentaries, keep everything flowing. Like the spice from Dune. I haven't seen the new Dune yet. Has anyone seen the new Dune? Yes. By the way, yeah, Frank. What's your review out of ten I, right now on the spot? I did like it. I I wanted to see even more Zendaya. Um, but honestly, yeah, it's it's like almost it feels almost like nonstop action because the first one is so much setup. The second one just fucking goes. There's lots of awesome scenes. There is a s- incredible gladiator sequence. That's like the highlight of the movie. Um, and um, yeah, I think they said they do want to make Dune Messiah after Denis Villeneuve. New, 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 whatever. Uh, make some other smaller films, but yeah, it's great. I didn't see it in IMAX though because every showing was sold out. But yeah, Dune Two rules. Nice. I like the impromptu review. Thank yeah, you yeah. so much. <laughs> I, I just had to transition out from the the spice flowing. Yeah, yeah. Jeremy, I, you have a thought on? I've Dune? only ever seen the David Lynch Dune. It's the only Dune movie I've seen. Which right is, with it's Kyle McLaughlin. It's a bad movie, but I kind of like it. 
I mean, yeah. I let let me let, let me like preface that it's a shitty movie that I kind of like enjoy because it's bad. Don't I? I don't want anyone to be like, oh, maybe it's like good. Maybe it's a hidden gem. I'm not. Maybe I should check this one out. Ooh, yeah, but it also that. seems like one of those things that age well with time. I'm assu- like, I'm assuming do they do like green screen stuff with the sandworms riding? I, I don't know. I, I, I know. Ca- <laughs> I don't even remember. Comic Lawson has crazy hair. Is Laura Dern? If it's a Lynch film, then I'm assuming Laura Dern's in it. Is she in it? God, I don't even I remember. So. Now. I haven't seen this movie since like high school. Um, but uh, maybe can we find a way to watch this for for no? I would love Is to. There Ooh, any, yes. Is there anything yes. relevant? We could. Okay, here's the here's the play. We do. We play Dune two, the original okay. RTS, like RTS, and then we're like, wow, that game was so good. Well, I guess we have to watch the Dune movie by David Lynch now. That's the connection. Well, if we want to get content pilled about it, there is that new Dune Awakening uh, survival MMO thing coming what? out. What? At some point. Yeah, there's the, they had it at PAX. There was a booth for it, but you couldn't play the game. They just like had a TV with the trailer playing and like a big Dune backdrop. I, I don't know. There's also- um, some people were able to play it, but... Are there also like Dune buggy racing video games? Like, like Smugglers Run? Aren't you driving <laughs> Dune buggies and sm- smuggling Ooh, drugs? That's- that's a connection. Yeah. Now we're talking. Yeah. Um, also, uh, Jesse, the uh, I feel like the uh, the Patreon things that we mentioned earlier, the extra features are. Ma- I don't think they're up yet. Um, I just want to clarify in case anyone was racing to watch them. It's probably it's too late now. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. We're recording it on Wednesday, so right. they maybe might they're up, up by right. Friday. Okay, let's let's pray. Let's please, Danny, make me make me not a liar <laughs> on the podcast on the crewcast, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anyway. Um, video games is what we're here to talk about, not my false promises of what's on the Patreon. Um, one of them, which I'm talking about for two reasons. One, because I think it's pretty cool. Uh, and two, because we get to talk to Frank about more Japan history and trips uh, experiences. Shashingo, Learn Japanese with Photography, is a first person language learning game. Now, this is really, really cool. Uh, It's more about like learning vocabulary than it is about learning like conversational Japanese. You're not going to be playing it and like talking with an AI, thank God, um, (laughs) to like teach yourself Japanese. But it's uh, it's more like a flashcard kind of game. So it's like a first person camera shooter game. Basically, you walk around uh, this fictional Japanese street. It's like a block of maybe... I don't know, like 40 buildings. Um, there's a bunch of signs and, and different things that you could take pictures of with your camera. And when you take a picture, it automatically generates a flash card. Um, and it stores them in this album that you can look at over time, which has like the definitions of what these things are. So when you take a picture, it'll be like, oh, this is a letter. Uh, all right. Tegami, right. Like, so you know what that is now. Or you take a picture of a car. And it's like a kuruma. And you're like, oh, cool. Like, that's a car. I mean, now I know what the word for car is. Uh, and you have this... Um, this game inside of it as well. So it's like a game in a game. Um, it's like a word finder game. So you can activate it from wherever and it'll pick out some of the flashcards that you've created with your pictures and it'll just say the word in Japanese and then you have to go and find it in the city. Uh, this is the first like language learning game that I've played like intentionally, not because like, oh, wouldn't it be funny if I learned German for five seconds? Um it works surprisingly well for learning words. Like two days ago, I did not know what the word for letter was in uh, in Japanese, and now I do. Or car. Um, or, you know, gacha gacha is one of those gacha machines. Man, that's great. That's that's very cute. Um, it's, it's a good kind of thing, I think, to play if you're, like I said, you're not going to learn Japanese. Like, you're not going to be able to have a conversation with somebody in two or three days of playing this. But you will be able to walk away, like, if you want to hop on from 20 minutes and just, like, learn a couple words. It's not a bad way to do that. It's it's like a surprisingly um, smart and like it's very cute. It's got good music um, and it does have, you know, speaking of the fact that it doesn't teach you conversational Japanese, it does have like a, a glossary almost of like phrases, things that you can say to people, um, greetings, regular stuff. Where's the bathroom? Uh, stuff like that. Uh, how do I get home? You know, I'm hungry. Uh so there's little things like that, but for the most part, it really is just a, a game about learning vocabulary and and doing it in this section of a fake Japanese area that like is cordoned off into into stores and like areas and things. So like if you want to learn what you would call a bunch of stuff when you go to the grocery store, you can go to what the game has as a grocery store. You can't go inside of any buildings, um, but the outside will have like a bunch of vegetables and you can take a picture of the vegetables and then you can select them in your album and do the word finder game to like build your 
memory of like what you call a carrot. I don't know. I didn't do that part yet. But I was just thinking like, oh, that would be fun. Like if I wanted to learn what a, what a sandwich was called. Uh, also, there is a dog that runs a convenience store, which I thought was very cute. A little Shiba. I'm, I'm buying it now. It's it's really cool. It's like 20 bucks on Steam. It's it's like a, it's adorable. Um, I think it's worth checking out if you just like the idea of it. Also, it works on Steam Deck. I was worried it wouldn't because it feels like the kind of thing that you need to use your mouse and keyboard to play with. But like it's actually perfect on Steam Deck because I think it's the kind of thing that you just hop on for 30 minutes, pick a couple of words you want to learn and then like try to drill them into your brain by playing the word finder game. Um, it's great. I, I just I have no complaints about it. I think like stuff like Duolingo doesn't do it for me. Doesn't heh, doesn't duo it for me. Um, but this, for whatever reason, maybe it's because I'm, I'm a, you know, a, a Luddite. I can't do anything. I just like if I could to click some buttons, I learn things better. Uh, anyway, that's my pitch for for Shashingo. I think I think it's awesome. I actually I was looking at this game the other day because. Uh, oh, cool. I I'm good at I've been learning Japanese off and on for like the last year or so uh and mm -hmm. I'm pretty good at remembering grammar um and I can like identify all the letters and I've got like uh, one to two hundred kanji memorized but I'm really bad at um vocabulary for whatever reason it's just very hard for me to like like Duolingo like you said it just doesn't work for me like I just there's something yeah. about it that just doesn't penetrate my brain I think because it's so boring uh so I feel like the gamification <laughs> of learning a language is really smart. Um, I even remember thinking like they have like sh shit like Fitbit now, but I remember when I was a kid playing The Sims for the first time, I was like, man, if there was like if there was a meter and when I like worked out, I got, I got like strong. Like if I leveled up <laughs> yeah. when I did tasks in real life, I'd probably would be like, oh, I'm going to go cook because I'm so close to like dude, I need four. I need we fit for chores. That's what yeah, I yeah, <laughs> dude, actually. Um, so I feel like gamifying learning a line. I mean, Duolingo is, is gamified, but it's yeah. I, I don't think anyone out there would call it much of a game. It's more just like the little owl pops up and he's like, it's been three weeks. What the fuck? Where have you been? Uh, it's a game in the same way that like cookie clicker is a game like, yeah technically but it's just a dopamine injector it's just, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. pressing buttons and like oh yeah mm. i think the only thing i ever learned from duolingo was was a little bit of spanish and it was not a sentence that makes no sense what was it yo, yo soy una manzana which is i am an apple which makes no sense but i'll never forget that manzana means apple so thank you little green bird please stop harassing me i'm not opening the app someday uh, you're going to be lost in a in a spanish speaking country and that's all you're going to know how to say that's right i'll say manzana <laughs> they'll be like we'll help don't they'll worry like, I've got oh you. my god he's yeah. one of us <laughs> yeah help, he knows. help this young man <laughs> uh, but like i said part of the reason i wanted to talk about this was to talk to frank about what it was like going to a place where you don't know uh, the language of anything and the signs are all not in, not in English. What do you mean? Some of them are. Um, yeah. But like for the most part, getting around and doing things was challenging because the first time I went to any place that wasn't English was uh, English primary uh, was Montreal. Yeah. And when I was there, it was like just, you know, a good amount of French, still a lot of English. I think everywhere has some English because like, you know, we're, we're dumb and don't want to learn other languages. Um, but when we when I got to Montreal, I was like, I don't know where I'm going. And it was interesting thinking about how they funnel tourists towards things by putting the English signage on the stuff. Um, so I was curious what, what your experience was, Frank, when you went to Japan with with the uh, language barrier. Yeah, like specifically Tokyo, there's so much English signage. but And you can also kind of tell like if an establishment wants foreigners or not, because if they, there will be zero English signage. And like if there is places that want foreigners, they will have a thing that says like English OK or foreigner OK, which is also kind of like, um, That's a yeah. Little, yeah. yeah, but like, again, like when I, when I would go 30 minutes or 40 minutes outside, I, like I forget the furthest town I went out is where the Toei like animation studio was. There was zero English anything anywhere. Like that was like I had a 7-Eleven encounter and the person there didn't speak any English. And like, but but. I would start to re recognize like the order of tra tra transactions, like you would put something down they would have the, the coinage or the, the amount you'd confirm it. And then they would, I forget the word they would say for a bag, but everywhere I went to, they would always say this and I should look it up. Or maybe if I play the game, I'll learn what bag is, but every place asks you if you want a bag and I always just be like, I just always also good improviser. I would just say yes. And everything. So I, maybe I got upcharged so much all the time. Every, I don't know. I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Oh, I love it. I want to see a Seven Eleven bag. Um, but no, I, I cheated maybe cause I use the Google translate thing all the time. Like I, yeah. I had never, oh, snap. I had never used it, even when I went to Montreal, because my friend lived there, so she, she was, like, you know, perfectly bilingual and it just guided me everywhere. But, like, Japan, like, the, the second half when I would be by myself, it was, like, I would use Google Phone. Sometimes 
owners or, or just people would already have like Google Translate ready, like to help me out or whatever. So people are so patient. I need to go to like a hostile area <laughs> and then find <laughs> out so I can learn by fight or flight. But I don't know. But like this is so cute and charming because even seeing it like, yeah, that's why I'm like I'm eager to play yakuza that's why i'm playing persona it's like i miss the vibe and the aesthetic of being in there but i liked the shishingo street like it l- very much looks like any street like even in the first screenshot it kind of looks like akihabara with like there's a giant like mech gundam like p- uh, poster on the wall and it's like oh that's cute as hell like are there are there pedestrians in this like shishingo or is it just like you're this pov and there's no P- other animals like i know it looks very very cute yeah though. so it is very uh like weirdly it almost feels like you're walking around a downtown street in the middle of covid like there's no yeah. there's cars but there's no like people walking around you're like what the hell's going on it's a bunch of signs for stores that no one's going in or leaving um but there are animals and that is part of learning it as well like there's there's cats that you can take pictures of and like i said there's a dog that runs a little convenience store um which i thought was really cute there's a lot of signage in the game uh and because part of it like i said is taking pictures and like making the cue cards um there's a lot of text that you can't read but you also can't take a picture of the text to like translate it. Like I'm sure with your phone, you were probably holding the camera up to stuff. And oh it, yeah. Like it would translate live. Did you do that at yes, all? Yes. A lot, yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I learned Danny what, and what I... the, the character for Yen is, by the way, I thought that was cool. I was like, Oh, that's nice. what that is. Okay. Anyway, so two little Jeremy. boxes with the little hangers and one's like a curly it, one. Yeah. Um, like, that's, what it costs. that's how I describe <laughs> characters. Whether, yeah, there was the one with the little curly. It's a little, little hanging with the legs. Um, when Danny and I were in Japan, we used Google Translate a lot. And uh, this was also like six, seven years ago. So I maybe it's like a part of that. Like it was worse back then. But I remember we went to a bunch of restaurants and we would sit down and get the menu and just translate it. And uh, the first day we were there, we were both exhausted, but we just needed to get one meal in before we went to sleep. And uh, we sat down and the first thing on the menu translated to like, uh, many tentacles in pile of mud. And we were like, this can't be right. That's not, I've, I've, I've been read a, one of these before. <laughs> yeah. Like it, I think tentacles is probably right, but I don't know about the mud part. Um, right. But it was, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's like having those mistranslations was kind of fun. It was, it's like the early, um, the early days of like when chat GPT was just GPT two and you'd be like, tell me 10 animals. And they'd be like a, a luscious elephant with many hair. <laughs> and you'd be like, well, yeah, okay, that is an animal technically like the jankiness of it made it more fun. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's funny. That's now we're now we're getting too good. But like we're in the uncanny valley of, of translations in this generative stuff where it's like, you know, for text, it's great because obviously, like I said, I'm not learning another language, but also like now, you know, you're like 95 percent of the way there. And the parts where you're wrong are like deeply wrong. Not like yeah. you said the wrong pronoun, like the word is like you just insulted their whole family when you meant to ask them where the local restaurant is that everyone says is good. Um, So that's that's funny. But yeah, yeah. Shashingo is. I don't know, man. There's something about it. I thought I wasn't going to vibe when I played it for the first time. I was like, oh, like, this is cute. Um, And I was kind of like, I don't really know what you do. Like, how do I play this for six hours? You know, this is a video game. That's what you're supposed to do with them. Uh, But no, it's like the perfect. It's weird to say something's the perfect Steam Deck game if it's not like some addictive dopamine blaster. But this is like 30 minutes before bed because it's only on Steam. I think if this was on mobile, like it probably run like not as good. But if you play it on, on your Steam Deck or like on just anything where you could pick it up for 20, 30 minutes and just like fire through it, have a coffee maybe in the morning before work and just like just spend a little bit learning some vocab, pick some words, pick a region you want to go to or like a, you know, what do you call a house? I don't remember the word. See, I'm going to have, now I'm going to have a, a failure on my, my word finder game. I'm going to have a, a weak it's, word. I'm going to have it's, to uh, I think it's E E E A. It's like I I E, I think it's, it's one I different than the word for no. So I always forget which one is no and which one is house. Oh, that's great. I'm so scared that's to talk about Japanese on the podcast because you know that there's like a hundred people out there who are fluent in Japanese that are listening to this. Even if the audience for this is there's small, a lot. How, there's like however I'm, many people live in Japan, I would assume. Right? I don't know how much reach we have in Japan. I was trying to lowball, uh, but <laughs> I, I don't know. I just feel like every time I talk about speaking Japanese, I'm just like at risk. Like uh, when I first started learning, I said katakana as katakana. And there was a comment where there's, they're like, this fucking idiot. And I'm just like, I'm, I, didn't, I don't know how to speak <laughs> Japanese. Like, that's, I just said, I'm just learning. But that's how you learn, right? Yeah, that's that's yeah. actually something I think that Shashingo does really well. Like, it opens with the message of like, it's okay, make mistakes. You learn languages by being wrong. 
you know? Yeah, on a podcast, yeah. preferably. No, that, that, yeah, so publicly, it, so it's for preserved everyone forever. That, that, that's why I'm very yeah. open about like what I don't know about, because I'm hoping someone will either be annoyed enough to correct me or generous enough to correct me. So that's why yeah, I yeah, like true. welcome. Like I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm very open. Like I don't know what this is. So like I don't know, but it's kind of fun to be bold and and, and arrogant with it. Like again, I had fun yeah, just yeah. just going anywhere. Like like yeah, I don't know. I, I I don't know. I feel like you get more confident the, the once you learn that it's not so bad to be wrong. It's like oh okay yeah, just correct me and. I don't know, yeah, or true. you will naturally naturally learn, but like this looks really cute. I I, I legitimately again I don't know what wrong, is wrong with me. I searched like Shishingo Expo. I want I need like trophies or achievements, <laughs> but the real a trophy or achievement will be rem- remembering the, the uh the remembering um the translations or whatever. Uh, I did try that's right similar photography. I did try Africa on PS3. Well, oh, so hell Africa yeah. is that Safari game, which okay. is one of the rarest. P- it was like a PS3 launch game. Um. So I tried that, and that was a game I had to play using the oh photo God. translation. And so in Africa, it's almost like Pokemon Snap. You're a safari, and you're on a safari, and you you get in a jeep and you go out and you get like an email that's like, "Hi, would you like to look for a gazelle? Would you like to look for a zebra?" So you get in a jeep, you go outside, you can take pictures, and then you have to report back to your camp and email the photos to National Geographic, and then they'll like buy your photos or not. I only played for like 30 minutes. Because at some point I couldn't figure out how to advance the mission, and I got tired of like pulling out my phone. But um, yeah, Africa. I, I I still don't. I didn't learn anything from it, but I did. I, it did tell me I was a good photographer, and that so I did get validated that way. Uh, so I've heard so of awesome. Africa before, <laughs> but I I had never known until this moment that in Hong Kong, South Korea, Taiwan, and parts of Southeast Asia, the game was released as Hakuna Matata with as the title. <laughs> no, I swear to what God. a wonderful phrase! <laughs> what a wonderful phrase! Uh, that's, that's awesome. That's fucking awesome. Also, this is again. I'm just displaying my my North American public school education. Uh, I didn't know that was a real phrase in Swahili. I I I never really thought that hard about it, but I was like, that's probably they what, probably Hakuna made Matata. That up. Yeah, I was like, they probably made that up for the movie. I didn't know that was Swahili. That damn pig Timon coming Pumbaa. up with words that bore just saying shit. Yeah, they should have said that in the movie, in the Lion King movie. They should have been like, and that part of the song, one of the lyrics should have been, and that's Swahili, you know? Yeah, the they need the, like the educated. MTV little bubble pop ups in the corner that are just like, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a the, real thing. I, I love the 2000s little pop up. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. my God. Yeah. <laughs> Throwback. I bar- I shouldn't even know what that is. I'm, I'm not old enough for that. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, good video game. You can buy it on Steam. It's twenty dollars. Uh, made by two people. It's very cool. They did a great job. Uh, I think, I think I will keep playing and and hopefully I'll be able to say one full you'll sentence you'll in have Japanese to introduce this the, time next year. You'll have to introduce the podcast all in Japanese. That's, yes. that's oh next no. <laughs> oh goodness. We'll do, <laughs> all right. We, we do a on. whole episode in Japanese, but it's just us being like, uh, "Toy de wa doko desu ka." We're just like asking where the toilet is over and over. <laughs> just saying, how do you say? And then the English thing we wanted to say. Like I love that yeah. in, in Italian, where you're like, "Como, como si dice?" Uh, and then the whole sentence. <laughs> <laughs> it's just "Como si dice?" the whole time. Yeah, that's awesome. "Como si dice?" Uh, I really liked this meal. It was actually delicious. <laughs> that's such, that's such a good cheat to like to speak. English in the middle of that episode is be like Como si-. uh, this is the Italian episode of course but you're like right, Como si you say I thought it was a pretty good game and like the shooting was tight and the mechanics were good you know just listen for our Italian away. narrated episode coming uh, to No Clip Crew as part of our Super Mario Oddities series this will be episode <laughs> 2 all all done in true Italian Wait, Como uh, Sidise is Spanish. I thought that was Italian. I'm oh, it's fucking Spanish? bad is it at not languages. Italian? Hold on. Isn't the, it's the same thing in Italian, though, isn't it? Uh, it probably is. I don't know. I just yeah. had to Google. I'm panicking now. See, guys, oh, speaking, no. la- oh, speaking okay. other languages freaks me out because so, I like. I feel like I'm like. I feel like I'm like insulting an entire like region of the earth by speaking their language wrong. I know that's not true, but there's something. I feel like I'm like in someone's house. And I'm like putting my shoes on the couch. I'm like, what is this? A fucking couch? And just like stomping oh, mud God. around. I don't know. <laughs> Culturally. Someone correct Jeremy <clears throat> in the comments. No, let just let me live in ignorance. That was so funny. You've you've got all the lung butter out of me. Thank you. Goodness. Hey, while we're sticking with the uh country of Japan, by the way, or at least Japanese exports, Persona 3, reload, I would assume. Frank, you've been gaming. Yeah. I hear. Yeah, I I didn't have anything new to report on, but like the when I came back from Japan, I was still overwhelmed by there's still so many games. Like even before I I think I said this last week too, like Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth, which is good. Um, Dragon's Dogma 2, which is very silly, but also like kind of overwhelming. Persona 3 is so linear and very chill and relaxing to play. 
even the game itself, like you're only ever going in that same dungeon, <laughs> which is kind of ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, then there's like e- there's like every full moon you do like one separate side boss battle, but it's the same dungeon the entire. And maybe I'm very early on, but but I do like doing the social links because even just going out to getting ra- going to ramen the bookstore, it's like ah oh, yeah, it's like I never left. It's so dorky, but I don't know. It's like holding <laughs> on to those things and like I still want to play Yakuza Three, but I don't know where I'm sticking with. But Persona is just one of those games like. It's sticking with me. I like it. The mu- like I, I listen to the music all the time. The soundtrack is good. Like I did get to go to the Persona Three Cafe, which was like not remarkable. Like every I don't know how often these these places like swap out the property, but it was like it was the Persona Three Cafe, and you order something, and they just like laser print like something on a cappuccino, and I'm like, oh, okay, sure. <laughs> it's like I don't know, but at the same time, I was like, yeah, this is cool. There's art everywhere, but yeah, I'm still stuck on Persona Three, but it's only because like. I don't know. It's all in Japanese. I like the, the, the aesthetic of it. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I, sometimes I get burned out by like trying to kick, pick up a new game every week to, to cover or talk about. Like, I'm curious, what's what is Stellar Blade? Because is that the what I thought there was like a demo is Stellar Blade or something coming out soon? What is I feel like that's like up my alley. What is Stellar Welcome Blade? Welcome to the Stellar Blade Hater Hour. I want to know this. me. No. So, uh, yeah, Stellar Blade, new game from the, was it, Shift Up Studio, right? The people who made the Nikkei game on mobile. I think you oh, played that for a little that, bit, Frank. Okay, I'm in, I'm in. Yeah, yeah, the booty shaking. That's your. That's the same developer, if you could, if, not if you could believe it, right, from the 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 bits that they've shown off in trailers. Um, yeah, I played the demo. I didn't finish it. I got maybe, like, half of the way through from what I saw on a YouTube playthrough where someone who had more patience than me played through the rest of it. Um, it... it, it I don't know. I didn't like it very much, honestly. Uh, I can see what's appealing about it. Like it has it has the like 15 percent of what makes other things cooler in it. Like so the way that you so basically it's a, it's a third person action game that plays like uh, more like a Souls game than it does like a Bayonetta, despite the fact that it looks like it should play like a Bayonetta. It doesn't matter if that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. Um so it's a lot more slower in its action. Like it's a lot more about parrying and dodging and getting the timing down. And then like you build up this meter that lets you do special attacks that do more damage. Um, and it's a lot more like one on one combat. It's very slow. Like it's a lot slower than it looks like it should be, especially because to say that it was just borrowing lightly from near automata would be understating uh, the things that it's taking. Like there's a floating robot thing that follows you around with like two arms sticking out that talks to you about the world and, and exposits from time to time. Again, like near automata is a little bot with the operator that follows you around. Um, you know, it's, it's about uh, saving humanity. Like it's, it's very, they wear their um, inspirations on their sleeve would be putting it nicely. It's like <laughs> their, their whole body is wrapped in their inspirations. Um, and it does have like a cool, it just has like cool things, but it doesn't feel cool. You know, it's it's so hard to describe the difference between those two things. But like, I think the best example is when you go to save, there's like a, um, it's like a, a vending machine that you put a coin in to save. And then there's a chair you can sit in that plays music. And there's like a record player next to the chair and like all this kind of stuff where I'm like, oh, like that's cool. If this was in a game with like a smaller budget and I wasn't constantly staring at this like very overly sexualized female character that I'm controlling, I would probably think this is really cool. But like, unfortunately then I stand up and like I'm doing combat that I don't think feels very good. There's a lot of input lag. Um, but the cutscenes are great. Like the, that's, that's another part of it. It's like, I'm telling you, like it's, it's got, it's got the aesthetics. It's got the veneer of something really sick. And I like, I want to play more of it because I think what it's nailing, it's doing well enough that I want to see where they go with it. Um, but the stuff that they're not nailing, which is the moment to moment gameplay and the exploration and the combat and the picking stuff up, picking stuff up. This is the worst thing, by the way, all game developers moving forward. If you have a bunch of items drop on the ground and I have to press the pickup button for every item, I'm going to hunt you down. <laughs> I'm going to find you and I'm going to show you that I can just, you could just hold buttons and just, you could, you could pull inputs from the controller. Um, but that's, that's my, that's my thoughts on Stellar Blade. I don't, I don't have, neither of you have played the demo or anything though, right? Nah, not my cup of tea. No? Also, I'm, I'm, was laughing when you were describing, uh, this game because I was imagining your fiance walking in on you playing it and it's just like a huge, <laughs> huge ass on screen. You're like, I have, this is for work and I have to play babe, this. Babe, it's okay? for work. Babe, babe, babe no I just, better, right? I just read it for the articles, babe. Dude, it's, you saw, I replied to someone on Twitter, babe. It's fine. It's, I'm, I just, I'm just doing tweets. discourse. I just had to, yeah, I had to talk about how this game disrespects women. So I had to play that, Exactly. It. I, I just respect you so much. Why do you, what do you mean I'm zooming in on the ladder climbing animation? I'm <laughs> this not is doing just that. the default the camera. camera. That's what happens. It's not my fault. Uh, 
But sorry, to get back to Persona 3, because I wanted to talk about yeah, that a yeah, bit yeah. as well. Because um, you you uh, you talked about it a while ago when it first came out uh, and shared your thoughts on it. I'd never played Persona 3, but I've heard really good things. Because like Persona 4 was was my jam. I love Persona 4. It's my favorite of the three that I've played. I haven't finished five, uh, and I'm currently playing three. But three three takes a while to get started. Did you feel that too? Like where where are you? You you said you might still be early days. What, what month are you in? Do you remember? I'm in July. July. Okay. I think we're about to. They like mentioned stuff about bikinis and stuff. So I think we're about to like go. <laughs> like that was the last thing I remembered. But no, I think I, of course <laughs> we did like midterms or finals for like July 18th or something. Um, no, mm. I feel like every Persona game, the first five hours or the but like, the aesthetic, it's always cool. But it's like they're slowly introducing new things. I feel like I finally unlocked people's like limit breaks or whatever. Which again makes the combat better, and like also everyone's also now like I feel like the last time I did the dungeon, finally I'm like, oh man, I'm starting to die more and, and things like that. So it's starting to get challenging as opposed to kind of just yeah, this is easy, basic like use the weaknesses, whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's still it's still fantastic. I'm having so much fun fusing all the personas and stuff. I'm trying to think like I don't know. I feel like I had never touched Persona Three. That was a game I was so intimidated to play back in like the original versions because I heard the fatigue system made it so difficult, and they completely got rid of it. There's all these quality of life features. Um, and then, yeah, I kind of got into it. I think I was like kind of speed running it before Japan, knowing I was going to go to the persona cafe. My save time is messed up. It says like 50 plus hours, but that's just cause I leave it running all the time. Um, but I think right. realistically I'm probably maybe 15 to 20 hours. I don't know how, how, how you would gauge it, but July, wherever, wherever that is. But yeah, it seems like it's, it's moving and, um, I get the flow of the systems of it again. Same thing. Like you have like your deadline. I think in this game, it's like every full moon you have to fight a boss basically, and yeah. then you have like 28 days, whatever the how the lunar calendar works, 28 days between between every full moon. And in that, you can basically grind the, the I don't know if they call it Tartarus, whatever, the, the dungeon. In the, yeah, Tartarus. Tartarus in that. You, I'm starting to do side quests now in that where you can rescue people who are trapped in there. Um, and then, but the, the fun of it is like, I do like doing the dungeons and grinding and fusing personas and just making those. Like there's a satisfaction in that. But it's grinding all the social links, like. So I just unlocked a guy who's called like the gourmet king, the gourmet king. Yeah. You notice like a fat boy yeah. eating and he's like, hey, yes. do you like to eat food too? Oh, do you want to come get some food? Yeah. And I'm come like, on. okay, that guy rules. <laughs> like, so it's, it's, that's, and that, that's the stuff that I love about those games is like the first time I played Persona 5, even though everyone told me like, just play the game. Don't worry about it. I was still like, oh, I should look at a walkthrough. And then eventually I was like, oh no, it's so much more fun. So Persona 3, I feel like it's truly the first time, even Persona 4, I feel like I still couldn't help peeking at stuff. But Persona 3, I think, was the first time that was like, I don't even know if I'm going to beat this game. I'm just going to enjoy it. And like when I stumbled on Gourmet King, I was like, oh, what the hell? Because that wasn't on my mini map. Like there's a lot of quality of life features. When you check the map, it'll be like, hey, if you come to this location, you can level up the social link. But sometimes a lot of the things aren't on the map. You just have to genuinely explore. Like I found a back alley and, and I unlocked a mission where I could feed a cat. Things like that. And it's like, oh, that's I mean, Yakuza does that stuff, too. But. Oh yeah, this is now like the Breath of the Wild conversation about like, oh, what if things aren't everything isn't labeled on a mini map? But um, right, yeah. no, it's it's just definitely like my cozy pick and play game. Um, but yeah, Persona Four I dropped halfway through. Persona Five I beat. Persona Three like yeah, I don't know that it's it, I'm like it's so hard for me to stick to a single game, but I might try this. I might try to stick with Persona Three. Nice. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in roughly the same boat with Persona Three. Uh, I think like where it excels it really excels like it's weird i love how how silly it is compared to five because like five is very like self-serious at times yeah. it's a little silly yeah. but like they know that like oh man we are breaking the law and we're the we're gonna thief your heart and steal it from you and this one's just like i don't know man yeah you're like feed a cat in the back alley why not or yeah, like it's, it's help these old people with their bookstore like sure yeah it's it's very loose and charming and i think that's why like yes. like i kind of don't even know what the hell the main story is. i don't know like I, there's whatever there's a you're like there is ghost. That, that's the weirdest thing is there isn't one yeah, yeah. Like, there's no main i'm 30 hours in i'm, th I'm no i'm 40 hours in now <laughs> like, i swear to god Three things have happened in yeah. the entire time I played this the game. The plot of Persona Three is such a Scooby Doo yes, plot where it's yes. like, it it's really like is. the, it the is coffins hunters. pop up. Yeah, yeah. And you're just like, yeah. so we had to figure out what's going on, and then you just kind of like there, go eat fucking Robin dog. for four months. <laughs> but the main problem is everyone's got to study for midterms, and then if you help Junpei cook, he he knows how to like shoot himself in the head better. I don't know. It's like it's like <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know. But that's why I, I like that. It's so like it's stress free gaming. It's yeah. it's yeah. really charming. It's so perfect and like. I don't know the, the lessons of persona spending time with friends like I don't know even if you read a little bit you level up your charm it's just like it's a very r nutritious game to play and reaffirming and sweet and gentle and like yeah it's also just playing it because I'm not worried like when an achievement pops up I'm like hell yeah but I'm not like 
all right, let me beat, I don't know, it's, so it's, it's nice to play a game, like, for pure enjoyment, like, I think a lot about, like, intrinsic motivation, especially, like, yeah. I love Noclip, because even, like, right now, I'm working on a project I can't talk about that's like, yes, this is cool, but, like, yeah, it's it's overwhelming sometimes, where it's like, I play games off-air, I play games on Noclip, I play games on Twitch, and it's like, wait, when do I want to play a game just because I want to play it, and Persona 3 is the thing that, like, rises to the top of, like, because I, I think I said this when I talked about this a few weeks ago, but, like, I remember the time in my life when I played Persona 5 that was, like, God, how long, 20, how over long, 2015, nine years, what, a long time ago. Something like that, yeah. And I, I would make time, like, every Saturday morning, felt like the one day I had time to, like, really get lost in a game, and I'd play for, like, four hours at a time every Saturday, and then over the course of six months, I beat it. Like, I even remember playing Persona 5 back when I still lived in this room. I moved down to San Diego, and then after, like, a month of, like, unpacking my stuff, I got back into my Persona 5 flow and then beat it down in San Diego, and then it was surreal to, like, move back here and then play persona four and then persona F- three. And it's just like, it's weird how like that series is always traveling with me too. Even literally on the steam deck, I brought it with me when I went up to like, I think Seattle a few trips ago. And it was just like, I don't know. It's, it's nice to have that eternal thing that stays with you. And I don't know. So persona is that. And again, I'm, it's yeah. so weird. Cause now in, in my head, like I played persona five when it came out years ago, but it's like, I still feel like a new persona fan. Cause it's like, I'm not, I'm not like doing PS one emulators to play persona one or that's so I, I thought, I think Jeremy is, Mess with the OG Persona, ones. I've I've played yeah. like the first uh, five or six hours of Persona Two, uh, yeah, and and I really liked it. Yeah, I I have a weird relationship with Persona. I've been playing Persona Five since like when did Persona Five <laughs> yeah. come out? But you played in like three hour chunks I, for the last I decade. Played, like <laughs> yeah. I played okay, it came out late twenty sixteen. I probably got it in twenty seventeen, and I am on the uh, the temple temple palace whatever the fuck they're called. Sure. Um, <laughs> the 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 like egypt themed one which is like it's not the beginning of the game but it's probably it's definitely in the first half of the game i play probably like five to ten hours of this game a year uh and i I don't know i like it so much and then i just like burn out on it it's like i think the problem is is that like the way my brain works is i just have trouble so this is why the game that i'm going to talk about that i played this week is good because it's so short because it's like what i can immerse myself fully in it because like if i sit down and play it for an hour i'm like i just banged out like 30 percent of the game i'm like fucking it's like productivity has ruined my brain for video games yeah. because when i play persona 5 i'm like okay it's been like five hours what have i done it's like well i i went into the dungeon once and i like got ramen i like went to the batting cages and i'm like i just like i it feels like there's so much game here that i just feel like i'm like <laughs> scratching the surface even if i spend a whole day overwhelmed with it. which is it's a good yeah. thing i just need to like change my brain i what i really need is like a fucking hyperbaric time chamber so i can play video games guilt-free that's like it's the passage of time that prevents me from beating persona 5 it's not my you fault. could do anything with the hyperbolic time chamber and it's yeah. and it's just get better at video games vegeta used it to get stronger what do you come on <laughs> uh, well yeah but has he beaten persona 5 i don't think that's so. a good point i yeah. feel the, the prince of all saiyans has probably done that that's it. He puts say? the scanner on. He's like, this guy's beat Persona 5. It's like, that's oh, the thing that intimidates him. How did he do it? It takes forever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I would use it for. No, yeah. Yeah, no, shorter games, like you're saying, if we're sticking to the uh, the JRPG or RPG, turn-based RPG through line here from Persona, let's talk about a very weird, very cool game, Felvedeck, I believe is how you say it, correct? Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, I, who's that's, to say? That's how I've been saying it. I, that's, okay. that's not knowing how to say things properly seems to be the the running theme of this episode. So right. um, <laughs> it it could be wrong, but uh, yeah, Felvedeck, um, or however you say it, is a uh, it's a it's a self described JRPG, but it's about 15th century Slovakia. Uh, it is a very short kind of like bite sized RPG. Um, in presentation, it's very like crunchy dithery uh like limited palette pre-rendered backgrounds it, it almost is kind of like um it almost reminds me a little bit of like a ps1 like monty python or something um yeah that's good yeah it's uh, it's something like that but tonally it's not it's very dry tonally it's not monty python at all um but uh but but also very funny uh so you play as a an alcoholic knight named pavel uh <laughs> and it's it's kind of just like I saw someone describe it as a buddy cop story. And I think I can't get that out of my mind. I like read that months ago during the preview phase of this game. And it, and I totally forgot it. And I was playing this game and I was probably an hour and a half in. And I was like, this is like a buddy cop thing. And it came back to me that like I had read that before uh, because and I think it's like the perfect description because uh, Pavel is like this alcoholic knight who's kind of like morose and down on his luck and his uh, his lady left him and stuff. Um, but your second party member who you get almost immediately is a, a very like 
not sullen, but like kind of like a very restrained priest who's kind of like, you know, shaming Pavel for the way he is. And they're just there's it's like this narrative battery is so charged by their personalities because they're so opposite that they're like the the back and forth between them, the different ways that they react to every situation. It feels very fun to watch their kind of like their interplay. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, it's like it's kind of exactly what you'd expect in a lot of ways. I don't want to talk too much about the specifics of it because in a game this short, I kind of feel like when when yeah. an interesting thing happens with the mechanics or the themes of the story, that's kind of like, that's what you're playing for. That's the carrot on the stick. Um, but like mechanically, uh, it has a battle system, which is fun because like, I don't know, I feel like a lot of short RPGs are kind of just about walking around and talking to people. This has like a dragon quest, earthbound, like old JRPG first person battle system. Um and it's a it's honestly it's like it's a proper battle system uh there were a few hard battles where i reloaded just to do them again and try out different strategies and stuff um so you your characters have abilities that are instead of mana you have uh tools and so you have like a tools bar that goes down so uh with your like mana or tools you can do things that lower enemies defense you can there are like stuns there's like heals uh all of the items are like appropriately themed. So all of the healing items, like the the Phoenix Downs are like a different type of liquor that you just pour out on top of the person who's died and they get back up. Uh, and then plum wine is like a healing potion. So it's kind of like a lot of familiar RPG elements, but wrapped in this very interesting kind of uh, abstraction into 15th century Slovakia. But uh, but it's really good. Uh, the writing is great too. It's very like yeah. uh, V-Thou, old, old Englishy kind of, um, but yeah, very kind of like funny and quippy. Uh, but I'm enjoying it a lot. It's I think I'm almost done with it. I'm about two hours in. It says it's two to three hours long online, so I got to be getting close. Nice. I played the demo for this. Frank, have you seen or heard anything about this until right now? Until no, five I, I, minutes ago. Looking at like the Steam page, it seems like the most Jeremy game ever. Like it, I love that it's historical. <laughs> right? It also it, yes. it also looks like something that could have been like released in the '90s as like an edutainment game. Like this is yeah, like yeah, yeah. insane. <laughs> like yeah, holy crap. Uh, it's. <laughs> it's really cool. Frank, I think you would like this game a lot. It might be a good, like, bite-sized JRPG, too, because, you like, you were talking about how Persona games are these things that stick with you for, like, months and years and stuff. This is, like, a fun kind of taste of that, but you can just, you know, bang it out in an afternoon. That's so wild. That's yeah, so cool. It's very light and silly. Like, the art style, I think, is the thing that, like, immediately is striking visually when you see the screenshots. But the animations, yeah. oh, man, the animations. There's, like, the odd cutscene that you get that's done in the sort of, like, 90s early 2000s maybe like even late 80s depending on on how technically advanced your computer was um like mist almost style cutscenes where it's like low poly dithered and like very weird almost like kind of hard to tell what's going on everything's like eight like faces for a bottle and like it's sitting on the table it's it's cute it's it's fun and then the battle animations when you're fighting are like you see the arms swing in front of the screen yeah yeah, yeah. And like the gun comes up and you shoot a gun or like you throw a molotov and it's like you see the oh, we're, we're, like it's just it's a it's adorable and weird and very like quirky and funny and yes it's it, there's everything to it i think it's like like Jeremy said, it's like the perfect, sweet little bite-sized three-hour RPG. It's exactly, you come in, you see everything it's got going on, and then it's over. It's not like, go grind. There's no grinding. You just, like, fight. There, the, the funniest thing to me, by the way, when I played the demo, I don't know if it's still there. I assume so, because I played it pretty close to release. There's a, uh, when you leave the first, like, town, there's a guard blocking part of the road. And you have to like, he's like, give us money or we'll kill you. And you could be like, whatever, here, like I have so much money. But then when you come back later, uh, you don't and you have to fight him. It's like three guys you got to fight on the street. But he keeps coming back. <laughs> like, oh, no does he? I kill him immediately. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's funny. I <laughs> so it's very fun that's There's like a lot that's like the game teaching you not to like give money to people because i mean you know it's a small i mean that's something i've been thinking a lot about is um designing a game like an rpg of this size uh, like this micro size because when you have a larger world like if you're like making a pokemon game you could just have like a loot table yeah. and you're like okay you kill like a normal enemy there's this percent chance to kill or to get to drop like a potion or like if they're higher level a better potion or whatever um i was thinking a lot about like item and currency economy in a game like this because you can only like there's there are no random encounters in this game as far as i can tell uh everything has been like a kind of like scripted battle encounter um so there's like i'm constantly stressing because there's like a finite amount of items that drop in the world and you can buy items but then there's like a finite amount of currency you get so i'm right. constantly freaking out about like did i use too many plum wines and now i'm gonna like soft lock myself at like you know 30 minutes away from the end of the game 
Um, Dude, but, I ask myself that in the real world when I go to the grocery store and I'm like, shit, I don't have enough money to buy this bread. What do I I'm gonna do? Get I should have had, those, I my had eight sandwiches yesterday. I could yeah. have saved that for the rest of the week. Just telling your <laughs> landlord that you got soft locked. You're like, yeah, I, yeah, my, oh, I overdrafted <laughs> my bank account and I got soft locked. That's, that's getting soft locked in real life is yeah. overdraft on your bank account. You're like, ah, dude, there's microtransactions now to access my money. What the hell's yeah, going on? Me. I hate it here in the real world. God, rent um, is but rent no, no, and gaming are ruined by microtransactions. <laughs> that that is a really good point though about the smaller worlds because like I've been playing something I'll talk about in a second, but like just making smaller games and when. You have to teach a player, not just like the economy and stuff like that's also very tough. How do you weigh that uh, stuff for somebody who's going to take exactly the three hours you're hoping it lasts versus someone who does grind or does find a bunch of stuff, right? You have to, you don't have to balance for both players, but like, what do you do in those, those circumstances, right? So there's always those challenges, but there's also teaching people stuff quickly in a small game. Like you do kind of have to rely on um, preconceived notions of game design and like utilizing the language of, of certain genres. Like if you make a JRPG, you kind of have to, and it's a short one, you kind of have to abide by the rules of that genre. Otherwise people who are coming into it later or coming into this game and don't have a ton of experience are going to be confused by tropes or maybe not get jokes because they don't know the specifics of it. That stuff's just interesting to me of like, obviously it's an homage, but like you still want to sell copies, right? You want to, you want people to buy it and play it. Uh, and even people who haven't played the genre. So it's finding that middle ground between homage and still introducing enough for, for newer players that I find to be, um, interesting to consider. Yeah. It's, personally. it's one of those things that I, it's kind of like a blind spot because I've played so many RPGs that when I, when I play an RPG, mm. like I, I don't even like in my brain, I play this and I'm like a oh, toolkit. That's like a mana potion. And then I just kind of like just absorb it. And for now on, it's like, yeah. I'm just using a toolkit. But like I had my mom play the beginning of disco Elysium. Uh, she probably, she oh played God. like the first like five or six hours, uh, half of which I was like on the phone with her. Cause she's like, I don't know what to do. This is like, I just, and I was like, well, Dude, have why you did you not film this? This should be on crew. This would be the greatest <laughs> fat session of my life. I know I, that actually would be really funny. I should get her to play the whole thing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just, just like a, just like a, like a, a five foot tall Jewish lady from Boston playing disco Elysium has got to be the funniest thing I can possibly <laughs> imagine. Um, uh, but she, she was like so baffled by things that I was just <laughs> like. She's like, so how do I, like, I, I can't think of an example, but like, how do I, there's like a thing on the ground. What do I do? I'm like, but did you click on it? And she's like, oh no, let me try that. I'm like, well, I like, it, it was crazy to me because I was like, oh, I have to like, I have to like communicate not only the things about, because when you recommend Disco Elysium to someone, you're like, okay. And then there's like physique and like, you, there's like, you have to, this stat raises your like mystical yeah. union with the universe. And like, you have to explain all the things that are different about Disco Elysium from a normal CRPG. But my mom going into it, never having played like Baldur's Gate or any like normal CRPGs, she's just like so many levels of abstraction that she's like, it's imagine if Disco Elysium was your first time playing a CRPG. You'd be like, is this, Oh my God. It's just like fucking, what are they all like this? Uh, but he was like, throw them in the trenches. Yeah. Right? Like, just like the most basic yeah. shit. I was like, Oh, this is like, maybe I should have started you out on like Diablo too. You know, a buddy of mine, by the way, has, uh, I'm now pitching for my friends, uh, has a YouTube channel, Rasputin. Uh, oh, it's, yeah. uh, he has a series on there called, um, gaming for a non-gamer, which is sort of in the same lens as what you're going through with your mom there. Um, it's a series he does with his wife where she plays, uh, sorry, the lady he lives with to all Rasputin fans. Look at why that's funny. Um, the, the, she plays like a genre or a game she's never played before. And it's interesting because she doesn't play video games, like basically any. So I think one of the first one was uh, they did Hollow Knight. And it was interesting watching her not have any faith in a jump. Like oh, really? the most basic 2D platformer thing of jumping between two floating platforms was for her a stressful moment because it's like, what happens if I miss the jump? You know, can I make that jump? What's my arc like? You know, so ha even having faith in something simple like that is tough for new players. Um, and, and the latest episode they did was on um, Baldur's Gate 3. Sorry, I was going to say Darkest Dungeon 2. It's not the same game. Um Baldur's Gate 3 and like it's it's she's played enough games at this point to like know how to use buttons and stuff but Baldur's Gate 3 is like from the CRPG line I think yeah. those games are already impossible to get into that one is like whew, like holy there's a lot going like, on so much Baldur's higher yes there's so much interaction the combat is so much like there's so much to uh to follow I think it's an interesting video just because like that 
to what you're saying is like there, there's so many parts to that where it's like it's easy to recommend something like Disco Elysium or Baldur's Gate 3 to someone who's played one of those games before because it is kind of the perfect, in my opinion, version of what they're going for. Um, but if you don't know the base level stuff, you're, you're just going to not have a good time because you're like, I don't know what the hell you want me to cast fireball on something. You know how lame that sounds? You know how dumb? Fireball. I just want to talk to the big red lady. I keep, every episode, I'll bring up Carlac in some way. Hell yeah. Anyway. Yeah. RPGs, but, man. They're cool. Yeah. So uh, I'm, tr- yeah. I'm trying to think if there's anything else about Felvedeck that I wanted to share before we move on. Uh, it. Uh, oh, the music is unbelievable. It's got like this yes. weird like like Eastern European psych rock thing going on. There's like this main song that has just like really good guitar riffs and trumpet. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just like something about it that fits. So well. you wouldn't think 15th century Slovakia psychedelic, <laughs> like weird surf rock, but it works so well. Um, it does. And yeah, just the like, I don't know. The aesthetic is, I, I was trying to describe it. Um, like I was trying to write down a description of it and it's not only like lo-fi and low poly, but sometimes the pre-rendered sprites of characters uh, will have like a photo bashed like robe or someone's face is like clearly a, a you know, indexed photo, like crushed uh, a photo of someone's face. And there's a cultist who looked like a guy from Harvester. I don't know. Do you guys know what Harvester is? Isn't that that it's like, like a edgy 90s, 90s? FPS, right? Yeah. Oh, that it's is- like the super weird, edgy, like point and click adventure yeah. with like weird, like incest and all sorts of murder shit. Uh, but it has like a similar kind of like photo texture characteristic to some of the stuff. It's just like, I don't know. It's oh, so yeah, I'm uncanny. looking at like the chat boxes. There's like an old guy that you talk to and it looks like a, a waiting. No, in a barber shop. And he, oh. Yeah. It's all just like <laughs> filmed people with bizarre expressions. But um, yeah, there's a little bit of a, a little bit of that DNA in, in some of the like photo texture stuff here. So, yeah, I don't know. Felvedek, highly recommend it. It's a uh, I think it's eleven dollars, which. I don't know. I think for for me, eleven dollars for like a, a great three hour experience. That's fine. That's yeah. like cheaper than going to the movies. Exactly to watch something that's not good for three hours, like Dune. Two. I haven't seen it yet. Obviously, Dune two. <laughs> We're looping back um, to Dune two. <laughs> no, you know what? The way you're describing Felvedeck, by the way, made me realize or remember rather what I thought of when I played the game for the first time. It feels like a playable zine. Like we, it feels mm. like your buddy Xeroxed a bunch of like cutouts from a magazine and just was like, here you go, play this for three hours. And yeah. Like, All right. That's actually sure. a great way of describing it. it. It's funny. Cause I wouldn't have even connected it unless you said that, but um, it reminds me a lot of, do you know Hylix? Yes. Yeah. Uh, very similar reminds, art style. It actually reminds me a lot of Hylix as well, which Hylix also has some of the first person like weird hands reaching out and stuff during the battle. Sequence oh, right. Stuff. Yeah. If people haven't played Hylix, Hylix is also fucking fantastic. Dude, hell yeah. More short RPGs. More video games yeah. you can finish in a weekend, please. Uh, yeah, Hylix is $3 on Steam right now. Sorry. Dude, buy it. If it's still on sale on Friday, pick it up. It's a. Oh, it's, it's not a even on sale. It just costs $3. It just costs $3? Right. Just costs everyone, $3? everyone go play Hylix. Yeah, please. Is Hylix 2 that cheap as well? Uh, probably no, I'm not. Making you, uh, I, have, I haven't Jamie, played Hylix 2. I heard it was really good. Uh, it's $15, Joe. <sighs> yeah. DMT. You guys ever tried the... No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, anyway, that's Felvedeck. Very cool game. You should check it out. Uh, Pepper Grinder. Speaking of short games that are cool yeah. and you can finish in a weekend. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. Pepper Grinder. Pepper Grinder. I love going fast. So Pepper Grinder is uh, the f- I don't want to say first because, I mean, they probably made like a bunch of stuff that I've never seen or heard of before. Um, but it's the first game that I'm aware of from a developer called uh, Rek or Eric, I think is probably how you say that. That makes more sense. Uh, published by Devolver Digital. And it is a 2D platformer where the main character has a drill. Her name's Pepper, <laughs> like in the title. Uh, and the, and the uh, her like antagonist kind of character, her rival is named Mint. So Pepper and Mint. It's cute. Um but she has a drill that's like the size of her body and using the drill, you do 2d platforming with like jumping and and regular old, you know, getting around like you would like a Mario. Um, But you use the drill to go into different surfaces in the world. So it plays like a left to right side scroller, but instead of like exclusively jumping, yeah, you, you dive into the sand or the dirt or collections of bones uh, and then like zoom out of these, these materials and land and hit enemies and and try to get through the levels uh, as quickly as you can, beating little platforming challenges. Uh, the fun part of the drill also with the diving is like, and this is what makes it feel so good, because it does, it feels amazing. Like Pepper Grinder is one of the best feeling platformers I've played, I don't know, in like 
four or five years. It feels as good as, and this is the nicest thing I can say about a 2D platformer. It feels as good as Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. Like, oh, wow. feel-wise, it feels that good. And it's almost, like, I think if they had more of a budget, it would be that inventive. Um, and I'll get to that in a sec. But the the diving aspect of it, uh, when you go into the sand, you can, like, maneuver yourself around. It moves, like, at a constant stream, but you can, like, turn the the sort of movement that you're doing. Um, and there's a boost you can do when you're in the sand or dirt or whatever. I need like a word for that. The, the stuff when you're in the stuff, uh, and when you do it at just the right time, if you're accelerating as you're leaving the space, you get like a really huge boost and like fly out of the sand really quickly. The stuff really quickly. Uh, and you can use that to chain around and get to things that you couldn't get to. And there's like collectibles and stuff. So that feels really good. And then there's like gimmicks in some of the levels. So because it's so short, they uh, still include all these creative new elements, these like different things that you can do in each of the levels. There's like a gun that you can use to shoot enemies. And there's like uh, a mech you find at some point it's in the trailer, a mech that you can use to like bash through buildings and stuff. And all of those things are used by interfacing with the drill. So like you hold the drill down and like you got the gun and then the drill becomes a gun and you're just shooting things from your body. It, feel, it just it feels absolutely fantastic. It, everything about it is so charming and fun and light and like the visuals I think are part of what sells that because it's it's got this perfect middle ground between like pizza tower. Like it's not quite um, fluid, like as fluid, like literally liquid as I feel like Pepito or whatever his name is from from uh, pizza tower is. Um, <laughs> what is this? Is it Pepino? I it might Pepino. be right now, isn't it? Pe Pepino. OK, <laughs> my boy. Uh, shout out to all the Italians out there. I promise that episode's coming. I wasn't lying. Um but yeah, so it's somewhere between Pizza Tower in terms of like fluidity and like a traditional 16 bit, like like Shovel Knight kind of um, platformer with that pixel art style because it's scratchy and light and like there's animations that are very sort of fluid and, and break the rules of a traditional pixel art style. Uh, but it still embraces the the sort of limitations of that. So it's 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 just so charming. It's so charming and fun. And like the movement feels really, really good. Um, and I think like maybe Neon White did this to me. I don't know if you guys have a similar feeling uh, post Neon White or if you felt this in the past, um, but sometimes 2D platformers will do this thing where they'll have time trial modes. You go back and do it again. Like, you, oh, if you could beat it in like two minutes, it's, you, you get a, I don't know, a golden idol. Like, okay, sure, whatever, I don't care. But now after playing Neon White, I have a different perspective when I see that stuff. And Pepper Grinder like lit the same light up in my head. Um, after you beat a level and it takes you like nine minutes, and then you see the time trial times and it's like, beat it in a minute 40. And all I think to myself now, instead of like, I can't do that is how the hell do you do that? Yeah, how yeah. the hell are you supposed to do that in a minute 40? Did you, did you guys feel that in the past? Do you have, have you played any platformers like that where you've gotten really into the, them? The first one that did that for me was Marble Blast Ultra on Xbox 360. Like, okay. It, what feels like 20 years ago, but I don't know. I don't know. Like 15, <laughs> eight, 16 years ago. But specifically at the time, it was the they had leaderboards just like Neon White, and that was like, yeah, I'm trying to think like say with the Marble Blast Ultra, and they've since put out like a more contemporary one like five four years ago. Um, yeah, mm. you'd beat a level, it'd say like I don't know Marble Mountain, and you would beat it in like three minutes, and then it'd be like, all right, your friend beat it in thirty seconds, uh, and then it's then you would figure out how to do it. So it's like. <laughs> Yeah, I think the first time I play anything, even like a Resident Evil game, it'll take you 20 hours the first time and then like six hours the next time. I try to just enjoy it. And then if I really if I like it enough, then I'll go back and try to do the challenge for it. But like, I think I have to really like the game to care about the time trial stuff. But like, that's yeah. cool to hear that Pepper Grinder has that like that juice and action in it. Yeah, it I does like I had like that with that, Neon yeah, White sure. a lot as well. Neon, I feel like Neon White is maybe the first game where I had that because it felt like um Sometimes when I see those time trial things, it doesn't feel like my brain can't even imagine the the vector in which I need to push my abilities to to improve. You know what I mean? Like I like to yeah. me, sometimes I see those times that people get and it's like my time is like two and a half minutes and there's a six seconds. And I'm like, that person is like that person went on the Internet and they looked up like how to how do I fall through the world to the last flag and like finish the level. Um, whereas Neon White, it felt like I was like I could imagine ways in which I could improve so I could work on them or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's like the thing that hooks me about time trial stuff is is are the game's mechanics such that I can like 
feasibly anticipate what I might need to do in order to like what what I would need to perfect instead of having to like figure out something that's like gimmicky or like, oh, if you if you walk backwards, you like fall through the entire level and then you just you know what I mean? Like I, I need to be like, oh, I'm I'm not good enough with this ability yet, but I bet if I could like improve on that, I could get at least half that time or whatever. But yeah, I don't no, exactly. really do much time trial stuff. I think Neon White might have been the first one for me. Yeah, no, I was totally the same way. That was the one that made me go like, OK. I get it. I get why these are fun and I get the like like you're saying, like it, it sort of opened my third eye for games where I like I see the thing you're supposed to do or like it, when you're playing a level for the first maybe two or three times, you just do it the way that it's supposed to go. And then you see something you see like a what is that there for? Oh, so I can skip this section. Hmm. Hmm. I got to get on the discord. What are they doing in the speed run community? So. This is definitely the one that and like to what you were saying, Frank, about like it's got to be really good to to make me want to do that. This right away, I was like, I could see how you speed run this because like the timing of getting your your boost out of the stuff and like flying really quickly. And like the level that really hooked me was the first secret level that you unlock. It's not really a secret. You just have to buy a key for it. Um, there's a like collectibles that you find around the levels. There's five of those like the Mario coins uh, and you use those to buy a key to open a level. And when you do that one, it plays like Donkey Kong Country. That's another one that I was thinking of while I was playing this Donkey Kong uh, Country one and two. Um, you know, the barrels that you get in in those games that like blast. This one has the same kind of thing in some of the levels where there's like a cannon that you put your drill into and then it blasts you to, to the next one. And the next one, you got to do them in a sequence really quickly. Uh, but you can like sequence break the cannons. So as they're turning, if you leave the cannon early before it finishes snapping to its next position, you get out faster and like you can totally cheat part, parts of the level. I was like, oh, this is I'm, I'm here, baby. Let me play the game. I'll play it for 100 hours, however long it takes. Um, I played, I've only played the demo of Pepper Grinder. Uh, I have not played the full game yet, but, um, it reminded me a little bit of, uh, Yoshi's Island for the, yeah. for the Super Nintendo. Um, I'm trying to remember, did you guys play Yoshi's Island at all? Yes. I Was, played the first little bit of it. Yeah. Wasn't there, I'm, I'm desperately Googling this and I'm struggling so much. Wasn't there a power up where, cause like you would get power ups where Yoshi would transform into like a helicopter and stuff. Yeah. Uh, wasn't there one that was like a digging machine or am I missing? Yeah. I feel like it, not a submarine or something like that. Like. You, you then you would shoot through a bunch of stuff, and then it would shoot you back up. I forget. Oh, here then, we go. Here we go. Cannon transformations. Car Yoshi, helicopter Yoshi, okay. mole tank Yoshi. It mole was tank. mole okay. tank Yoshi. That's what it was. Yeah, that's what this game reminded me of. I don't remember. I gotta look this up. Mole Yoshi, my boy. Just look up. Mole oh my tank god. Yoshi. He's like a little yellow sunglasses. Yeah. Mole. It's dude. There's no cute. way this is. Oh, I yeah. know this is real, but there's no way this is real. This dude, is look like up, some Mario uh, Oddity stuff. Okay, hold on. I, yeah, this is. Uh, I'll, let me fi make sure everyone can Google this. Uh, car. Look up Car Yoshi as well. And there's a little blue Yoshi head. That's it's like the second row on my Google Images with red wheels. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite one. They beheaded Yoshi and put wheels on him, and but now he's did. a car. Look how they massacred my boy. Look how they massacred my boy. <laughs> In my search for the mole tank, I also got uh, mole Yoshi, but like it, it looks. I guess it's from like a, a, a Wooly World or whatever that game's oh, called. Yeah, he looks like just a, the worst creature I've ever seen. I gotta drop this in the staff chat. Is this the one this where it looks no like context. he has two like um like like Chinese chicken wings from a fast food restaurant on his arms? No, no, I don't think so. Anyway. Okay, I, mean, man, I, 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 I might be seen enough I might be poorly describing the thing you're looking at. <laughs> Okay, yeah, no, that is the one I'm looking at. It looks like he's That's got like fucking okay. he's got like crab rangoon arms. <laughs> that, yeah, okay, yeah, I see that. I, I see the know. crab rangoon. His though. arms look deep fried in this image, is what I'm trying to He's get. got like cat whiskers. Yeah. Too. I don't know. Whatever. Anyway. Anyway. Yoshi. It's a good game. Yoshi's Island's great. Yoshi Island 2? Less so. Uh that's the one with the crying Mario baby, right? Uh Yoshi's Island, yeah. And he goes, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I remember I used off. to play that game as a kid so loud. My parents would be like, what the fuck is that noise? Like, <laughs> Kicking you out of my house. Turn that. Well, turn that that's why down. it incentivized you to like never get hit. It, like, that's really true. It was like nothing right. was that, worth yeah. the 20 seconds of the crying baby. But yeah, I felt guilty. <laughs> the real too. punishment. Yeah, it cut me to my core. Oh, brutal. But yeah, Pepper Grinder. It's a fun game. Uh, it's available on Steam, GOG, the Epic Game Store, and Nintendo Switch. No Xbox, unfortunately. No, no achievements, uh, as per right now. But it is uh, very good. It's like fifteen bucks. It's killer for fifteen dollars. Uh, it's only like four hours long, which is not a complaint. I am so glad that there are more like games getting. Not like there's always been short games, but I feel like there's like more games that I'm getting to play right now um, that are coming up on my radar that appeal to me more 
that are short, that are sweet, and that are doing what they're supposed to do. And when I finished this, I was like begging for more, but I wasn't like upset that it was short. You know, I was just like these mechanics, everything they're doing are so interesting that I want there to be more of them. Not like I'm upset that there's not eight hours with like, oh, man, what if the drill could do this for, for eight hours straight? What, here's a battle pass. Grind out the thing. Like, I don't I don't need any of that. I just I, want more pepper grinder. Dude, I would always rather be left wanting more of a game yes. than have it last a little too long. Like, I would always rather sure. feel like, oh, I would have like one more level. I would have like because then it's like, you know, it's like leaving a restaurant after a good meal when you're like, I eat so much. I want to throw up it like. It puts a little stank yeah. on the experience, whereas you're like, you know, you leave walk the buffet, out. You're like, I'm trying to not puke. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying my <laughs> feel best. So, the, good, the food was good, but I feel so sick that it's like a, <laughs> those teriyaki meatballs were good in the first five minutes. I, and then I just I, have, I kept going. I have done that once. I've go, gone to a Korean barbecue restaurant, ate so much that I threw up in the parking lot. So. Dude, I did that. No. I did, that was like when I was th- 24. So like nine years ago. But I, I remember did they charge that. you for leaving food there. No. I, and maybe that's why <laughs> I just can't remember the I think like we had a friend like he was going to get married about to have his kids. So it was like, all right, let's celebrate. And then we just ate so much food for no reason. <laughs> Dude, oh my God. I went to a I went to a Mexican restaurant. My my growing up, my mom and my brother hated like Mexican food, Indian food, like all like non super normal, like basic ass food. So me and my dad would go out and get food together. That was like different. And uh and I, it was such an exciting experience for me because we wouldn't eat that shit at home that I was like, oh, like Mexican food. I'm going to eat like a thousand enchiladas and like tamales. And they're like get a burrito, too, and like try anything. And I remember when I was like 12, we went to this place in Haverhill, Massachusetts, and I ate so much that I I immediately threw up upon leaving the restaurant so close to the restaurant that I threw up. I threw up on their front steps. And my, oh, my God. And I was like, that's got to be that's like the worst thing as a restaurant. Is to have some, like I was and like, they have to clean it. Oh, yeah. Gonna walk out it all the way in. I like. always imagined uh, like if you were walking by the restaurant at that exact moment and there's like two people coming out and someone just immediately <laughs> Just leave the restaurant. It's like, like, well, we're not, honey, we're not going there. Sorry, dude, that's worse than a one star Yelp review. That's like, that's a million times worse. It was terrible. It's like, it's so cartoonish to just like immediately puke as soon as you leave the door. Yeah, that that reminds me. There was a uh, in high school. There was a a Japanese sushi restaurant that we went to after uh, no before prom. We were pre gaming at the at the sushi restaurant and uh we or we you know ate our our fill we had a little wasabi on some of our sushi we had our dragon rolls we had our toronto rolls which had cream cheese in them because we were disgusting uh and then at the end of the night one one couple wanted six pieces of sushi so they were like oh i'll order six of the thing they served them by the roll we had 40 after everyone was done eating 48 pieces of sushi showed up and they charged you two dollars per thing you didn't eat because it was all you can eat, and that's how they made their money, right? It was people with uh, eyes too big for their stomachs. So we had to eat 48 pieces of the most disgusting avocado-filled sushi I've ever eaten in my life. Wait, disgusting because you don't uh, like avocado, or disgusting because the avocado was bad? No, disgusting because uh, eating that much avocado in a row, okay, okay. eating any 48 of anything will make you want to die. True, true. <laughs> Especially Jesus when you're Christ. done eating. Um, me and my buddy Nico and Kenny, um, shout outs to my boys. I hope they're doing well out there and never eat another avocado until the day they die. Um, but that was an experience, man. Overeating is uh, it's so easy and so awful at the same time. It's bad, dude. I All miss buffets. I haven't been to a buffet in like forever i can't remember the last time i went really? to a buffet i used to go to buffets all there was a place called literally just called china buffet when i was growing up <laughs> and it was just like a shitty strip mall chinese place um as you might imagine from the name but it was the best dude buffets rock i mean they're kind of gross was there an event that perhaps made you not want to go to buffets anymore maybe something uh over <laughs> some the sort of like global pandemic years. yeah no, no i just i've happened. i fell off the buffet train long before that i need to get back into it that's fair. You saw one lady sneeze at the salad bar and you're like, that's it. That's okay, it. I, I didn't know that could happen. I, did, <laughs> I didn't know people sneezed on food. This is yeah. the first time. I'm I'm 27 years old. <laughs> anyway, uh, I think that's uh, that's a good place to call it. Sneezing on food. Uh, enjoy the next time you go to a buffet, folks. <laughs> uh, Have fun while you're out there. Uh, thank you so much for listening to the No Clip Crewcast. Uh, we talked about a lot of video games today. We talked about a lot of fun stuff, uh, languages and and whatnot. And uh, we're, you know, we're we're sad that uh, Danny's not here this week. But like I said at the start, he's doing well. He'll be back shortly, soon-ish, uh, to update you all with how he's been, what's been going on, and and potentially what video games he's been playing while uh, sick in bed. Uh, he said on Twitter that, like I said, he he lost an organ. I can't wait to find out which one it was. I feel like I feel like I might know. 
Um, hopefully it's not anything important. <laughs> just one of those ones there. They're like, you can take that one out. You don't really, you don't really need that. We're just not going to. It's crazy gonna that we have that organs way. that you could just like not. Right, that you have. don't need vestigial yeah. stuff, right? It is like, odd. Like, you don't need a pinky. I mean, I pinky do. toe. Sorry. Yeah. Well, yeah. But you, you don't need a pinky toe. You can chill. It's optional. Do you isn't the pinky toe good for it's like, like balance or something? Yeah, do you need that it's for fine. balance? But you don't need it. If you cut it off, you or just what like is it, follow. Like, uh, that's like the that's like the plot of every saw trap is like lose your <laughs> pinky to live, lose your leg, lose your eyeball. It's like I don't know. Uh, what is it? You take something that we're allowed to lose. Just just cut know. off like a uh, what is it? You don't need your appendix Give, or whatever. Gives a, just, hair, gives a yeah. haircut. I don't know. Yeah, lose your be, haircut. That'd be <laughs> a great saw trap. Is he's like there's a bomb strapped to your appendix, and you're like, eh, eh. Uh, I mean, I. <laughs> Well, only dead from appendix. time to time. Yeah. 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 Ooh, oh, jeez. Uh, anyway, uh, if you want to send in emails, you could do so. Podcast at noclip.video. Let us know your thoughts on things. Share your opinions. Let us know your favorite buffet food to not have sneezed uh, mucus on. We'll, we appreciate hearing that. Um, and and we're going to update you with what's going on uh, at Noclip once we know what's going on at Noclip. Uh, Jeremy is currently working on Jane Dev episode four, yes. which is done and coming out right now. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, what, what's the update on that? Uh, it's it's pretty close. I My allergies have been so fucking bad that every time I sit down to do voiceover, I'm like, you know, the thing about making it, it's like it's <laughs> it's impossible. Um <laughs> Squinny. <laughs> yeah, I've I've also just had like a like an abiding headache for days. Uh, oh. So I've been working on other stuff. I've been working on behind the scenes stuff for Pentiment documentary. Uh, I also, since our filming schedule got all jumbled, I uh, I put together a bunch of pitches for no clip documentaries. Yes. and I sent them to Danny in his in his sick bed, and I was like, hey, what if I made any number of documentaries to take the load <laughs> off your shoulders? And uh, and he seemed excited about some of them. So yeah, so might be. Uh, leading the charge on a couple couple docs about uh you know i mean they're they're games that came out over 20 years ago because they're games that i'm pitching as documentaries but um but all the old pc games heads are gonna be eaten well if i get my way that's good i mean like think mm. about ken burns he was pitching documentaries of wars that happened hundreds of years ago that's so, so like, true dude. you know like yeah, yeah ken burns <laughs> <There you laughs> that's, <go>. like, <laughs> that's funny to think he could only pitch like current events he's like this is happening right now we need to make this documentary like Ken, I don't, oh, I don't we, think we have, we don't have perspective on this yet, Ken. No. No, we got to do the the Will Smith slap. We got to get that in there. He's like, okay. oh, I don't even really care about this, but Ken uh, Burns is the slap heard the around the world. Yeah. <laughs> do you know there was a show called The Slap on NBC? It was just a whole show about a a guy slapped a child at a birthday party. I think. What? And there was like a six season or six episode season of TV. That was the whole premise. <laughs> like. Holy shit! That sounds terrible. That's like uh, that sounds like somebody watched an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm, and they were like, I could do this. <laughs> "Larry David's Maximum." They were like, "Huh, we could make. I could write seven episodes. I could do a whole easily. show based on this one episode." Yeah. yeah, this is us, but for slapping people. Uh, no, that's exciting, man. I can't wait for more Jane Dev, more Jeremy Jane content. I've seen the pitches as well that Jeremy was talking about. They're very good. They're about things that uh, I think people who like no clip content would be big, big fans of. So. That's awesome to see. Uh, the early access stuff for Pentiment uh, is up. You can watch the doc, right? That's available currently, right? I'm not lying about that one. <laughs> I I think so. Let's double check. I, so. I never yeah, check the Patreon. Check. <laughs> the, the thing about being on Patreon is that Danny does the Patreon stuff, and I'm scared to check it because I hate seeing my own face or hearing my own oh, voice. Yeah, I don't blame you. Uh, yeah, not because your face isn't nice to look at, but because it's just scary to see your own <laughs> that's face. That's the most back end. To be you're clear. Like, Dude, yeah. if I had your face, I, I wouldn't want to see yeah, it Yeah, look at you. sucks. Yeah. yeah, this podcast, I'm tired of looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, the, the making of Pentiment is currently up on Patreon. You can watch that. Uh, but the behind the scenes stuff and extended interviews will be up soon, hopefully. Maybe when the podcast is out, I hope. Fingers crossed. Uh, we're still working away at stuff. Hyperlight uh, development episode three is currently in development, although I feel like there's always new things happening at Gearbox and Embracer Group now. And there's that sale of, of Gearbox, but the Embracer kept Hyperlight or Breaker, whatever it's called. So that's theirs. It's very confusing. This is going to be probably a very long, very uh, uh, interesting episode. Uh, once it's live and dear Dwyer, the podcast that Danny and I've been working on uh, is, is coming together. Sorry, Jeremy, you have uh, something to say about Hyperlight Breaker. I was just going to say it's um, I, we, I never would have anticipated this when I pitched the Hyperlight Breaker doc, that it would have been like, uh, 
You know, when they when someone has like digestive issues and you put like radioactive dye in their food so you can track what's going on. <laughs> I feel like the Hyperlight Breaker team are a bunch of like cool people who are embroiled yeah. in this giant like machine of of finance and video games and business. And it's like I never would have anticipated that. I'd, you know, I always just thought, oh, it's going to be cool to watch this game get made. But uh, it is kind of interesting that it's also become this thing about like, you know, learning about not only how games are made, but uh the, the weird processes that they go through with publishing and with publishers selling and buying and consolidating and stuff. So yeah, it's an interesting angle. Yeah, It's on a it. part of things that uh, I'm glad no clip gets to do more of as time goes on. Right. I mean, we've got the game we're working on with Alex Austin. So that's cool. People at PAX were like, that's so cool that you guys are doing that. I can, sucks. You can't get money. <laughs> and I was like, ah, fuck off. <laughs> Here's five bucks. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, the podcast is coming together. Uh, I just finalized the Bellatro episode, so that should be up soon. Uh, oh, spoilers. I guess that's the, maybe the first episode going live. Who knows? Dandy gets to finalize all that stuff. But it's a good episode uh, with interesting interviews. And you'll learn that the origins of uh, Bellatro, spoilers for the podcast, are uh, from watching Northern Lion. So uh, really changing lives, that egg of a man. Um yeah, and if you want to support the podcast, you want to fund our documentaries, get access to all the stuff that I mentioned and keep us all healthy, hopefully, and uh, and thriving, you can do so at patreon.com slash noclip. Follow us on Twitter at noclip video. You can follow me at Garasha. Follow Frank or Flank at Frank Howley. You can follow Jeremy at Jeremy B. Jane and follow Danny on Twitter as well at Danny O'Dwyer. Get updates on health and how he's doing. Uh, boys, what are you doing for the rest of your uh, weeks? Uh, well, I right oh, right Frank. now, yeah, right now I'm about to go to the Knott's Boysenberry Festival, like, which is oh that happens every year. Uh, Mega Six Four always gets a big group together, so it'll be interesting to see if friends out of t- friends who are like flying down for it specifically. So it'll be nice to catch up with a bunch of friends. The weather is finally good, which is crazy. Like I went on a big hike last weekend, so maybe I'll force myself out of the house again. And then this weekend is. It's WrestleMania weekend. I don't care about WWE, but what happens every year is surrounding WrestleMania weekend is every independent organization throws on wrestling shows. So uh, a lot of like the Japanese wrestlers I saw in Japan are in Philadelphia this weekend hosting shows. So I'll be I'm excited to like watch all that online from home. But so it's like I don't know. It's it's like my Super Bowl is this weekend. So I'm excited. <laughs> that's awesome. That's the yeah. That's that's so that sounds like so much fun. Holy yeah. shit. Fuck. Uh, Jeremy, what about you? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I think I'm going to take the rest of today off. I've been working for, I worked like over the weekend and I've worked for like the last six days. Yesterday was my first day off in like a week because like I, I said this in the last podcast, but I like, I went away for like two and a half weeks after working like two and a half weeks without a day off. And now I'm back and I'm like, I have to get back to work. I just feel like I'm in this like weird cycle of crunching all of my work days into like 15 days straight. So, uh, yeah, I'm trying to trying to normalize i'm trying to normalize by having a weekend in the middle of the week where i also do a podcast you know just like normal weekend stuff Tuesday, totally Wednesday. super normal yeah that's that's how everyone does it yeah weekend in the middle of the week i'm trying to try to get back trying to normalize my schedule a little bit is what i'm up to nice good for you do that yeah relax take a break you, you worked your butt off um and yeah i'm just checking out there's a solar eclipse total solar eclipse happening on monday finally passing us for the first time in 100 years so I'm very excited to watch that. I promise I'll wear the glasses. I'm not going to blind myself staring at the sun like a moron, like a like a past president perhaps uh, would do, like a very smart genius person. Some people are saying the smartest. <laughs> um, and that's <laughs> thank you so much good. for listening to No Clip Crewcast. I think that's what we end on is a, is a Donald Trump impersonation. Uh, thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.